Matter is made of atoms. Now, if in some cataclysm, some incomprehensibly huge, destructive, and magnitudinal event, all of human knowledge and all of scientific research were to be destroyed, and only one, one statement passed on to the next generation of creatures. What would convey the most information within the fewest words? I believe that it is the atomic hypothesis. That all things are made of atoms. Little particles that move around in perpetual motion, attracting each other when they are distances apart, but when, but repelling upon being squeezed together. In that one sentence, you will see there is an enormous amount of information about the world, if just a little imagination and thinking are to be used. To illustrate the power of the atomic idea, suppose that we have a drop of water a quarter of an inch on the side. If we look at it very, very closely, we see nothing but water, but smooth, continuous water. Even if we magnify it with the best optical microscope available, roughly 2,000 times, then the water drop will be roughly 40 feet across, as big as a large room, and if we looked rather closely, we would still see relatively smooth water. But, here and there, here and there, you may, you may see football-shaped things swimming back and forth. Very interesting. These are called paramecia. Though with their wiggling cilia and twisting bodies, you can go no further, except perhaps to magnify the paramecia still more and see inside. This, of course, is a subject for biology. But for the present, we pass on and look still more closely at the water material itself magnifying it two thousand times once again it looks something like a crowd at a football game as seen from a very great distance teeming mm, teeming little balls all distorting the perfectly smooth shape of otherwise unmagnified water. In order to see what this teeming is about, we will magnify it another 250 times, and we will see something similar to what is shown in figure. This is a picture of water, magnified a billion times, but idealized in several ways. In the first place, the particles are drawn in a simple manner, with sharp edges, which is, of course, of course, my students, you would know this, for you are intelligent creatures. This is, of course, inaccurate. Secondly, for the sake of simplicity, they are sketched almost schematically in a two-dimensional arrangement. Two. That, of course, as you will know, being 
the clever individuals that you are. We exist in a three, or perhaps four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven dimensional universe. And of course, we can only move within three of them. Four, technically, but that will be the subject for another lecture. Notice that there are two kinds of blobs, or circles, to represent the atoms of oxygen in black and hydrogen in white. And notice, of course, that you will, for you are not merely intelligent, but observant, mightily so, that each oxygen has two, two hydrogens tied to it. The picture is idealized further, of course, in that the real particles in nature are continually jiggling and bouncing and moving everywhere, turning and twisting around one another. You will have to imagine this as a dynamic rather than static picture. Another thing that cannot be illustrated in a drawing is the fact that the particles are stuck, stuck together, that they attract each other. This one pulled by that one, etc. The whole group is glued together. So to speak, on the other hand, the particles do not squeeze through each other. If you try to squeeze two of them too close together, they repel. The atoms are one or two times ten to the minus eight centimeters in radius. Now ten to the eight centimeters is called ten to the minus eight. My deepest apologies. 10 to the minus 8 centimetres is called an angstrom. So we say that they are 1 or 2 angstroms in radius. Another way to remember their size is this. If an apple is magnified to the size of the Earth, then the atoms in the apple are approximately the size of the original apple. Now imagine this great drop of water, 15 miles long, for we have magnified it such, with all of these jiggling particles stuck together and tugging along with each other. The water keeps its volume. It does not fall apart because of the attraction of the molecules to each other. If the drop is on a slope where it can move from one place to another, it will flow, but it does not just disappear. Things do not just fly apart. because of molecular attraction. Now the jiggling motion is what we represent as heat. When we increase the temperature, we increase the motion, the wiggling, the, the dancing, the twisting and turning of each individual molecule. If we heat the water, the jiggling increases, and the volume between the atoms increases, and if the heating continues, there comes a time when the pull between the molecules is not enough to hold them together, and they do indeed fly apart! This we know as steam. Increase the temperature, and the particles fly apart due to increased motion and they become gaseous, such as these objects which fly through the air 
none of them connected, for they are all individual. For now. In figure one to two, we indeed have a picture, an image of steam. The picture of steam fails, however, in one respect. In ordinary atmospheric pressure, there might only be a few molecules in a whole room, and there certainly would not be as many as the three which you have observed in figure one to two. Now, in the case of steam, we see the characteristic molecules more clearly than in the case of water. For simplicity, the molecules are drawn such that there is a 120 degree angle between them. In actual fact, the angle is 105.3 degrees. And the distance between the center of the hydrogen and the center of the oxygen is 0 0.957 of an angstrom. So we know this molecule incredibly well. Let us see what some of the properties, of course, of steam vapour or any other gas are. The molecules being separated from one another will bounce against the walls. As I demonstrate. Imagine a room with a number of tennis balls, a hundred or so, bouncing around in perpetual motion. When they bombard the wall, this pushes the wall away. And of course, as you will know, according to Newton, they both, the wall and the tennis ball, exert an equal force upon each other, causing the tennis ball to bounce off of the wall. This means the gas exerts a jittery force, which our coarse senses, of course, not being ourselves, magnified a billion times, for otherwise we might be giants. Feels only as an average push. In order to confine a gas, we must apply a pressure Figure one to three shows a standard vessel for holding gases. A cylinder with a piston. Now it makes no difference what the shapes of water molecules are, so for simplicity we shall draw them as tennis balls or little dops. Conceptually, it is all the same. So many of them are hitting the top piston all the time that to keep it from being patiently knocked out by of the tank by this continuous banging motion. We shall have to hold the piston down using a certain force. This we shall call the pressure. Clearly the force is proportional to the area for if we increase the area, but keep the number of molecules per cubic centimetre the same, we increase the number of collisions in the same proportion as the area was increased. Now let us put twice as many molecules in this tank, so as to double the density, and let them have the same speed, i.e. The same temperature. Then to a closer approximation, the number of collisions will be doubled. And since each will be just as energetic as before, the pressure is proportional to the density. If we consider the true nature of the forces between the atoms, we would expect a slight decrease in pressure because of the attraction between the atoms, and a slight increase because of the finite volume which they occupy. Nevertheless, to an excellent approximation, 
if the density is low enough that there are few atoms, the, pr the pressure is indeed proportional to the density. We can also, of course, see something else. If we increase the temperature without changing the density of the gas, i.e. if we increase the speed of the atoms, what is going to happen to the pressure? Well, the atoms hit harder because they are moving faster, and in addition, they hit more often, so the pressure increases. You see how simple the ideas of atomic theory truly are. Let us consider another situation. Suppose that a piston moves inward so that the atoms are slowly compressed into a smaller and smaller space. What happens when an atom hits the moving piston? Evidently, it picks up speed from the collision. You can try it by bouncing a ping pong ball from a forward moving paddle, for example, and you will find that it comes off with more speed than that with which it struck. So the atoms are hotter when they come away, for they have more speed and thus more energy, more thermal energy. Therefore, all of the atoms which are in the vessel will have gained speed. This means that when we compress a gas slowly, the temperature increases. So under slow compression, a gas will increase in temperature, and under slow expansion, it will decrease in temperature. Meet me next time in the Feynman Lectures.